live with the community. This is the Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Development Bi-Weekly Call. Today is July 21st. How are we here already? Halfway through the year, more than halfway. My name is David Warner. I will be your host today. Let's see what we're going to talk about today. We are going to see the latest on PNP Framework Core SDK. We're going to talk about MGT, Independent Publisher Connectors. We're going to see the latest on a variety of samples, script samples, Microsoft Team samples, Power Platform samples, and then it'll be a little time to do our together mode photo, time that everybody loves. Then we're going to see our all-stars of the day, Ankit on document automation with syntax content assembly. Ian is going to cover building an app for Microsoft Teams, which creates conversational tabs and conversations based on external events. And then, of course, we're going to hear the galloping of the warrior horses for some list formatting with Chris Kent. So we look forward to all that. Let's talk about how you can get involved in this community, and we absolutely welcome and want you to get involved. There are a number of opportunities for you, the first of which is you could absolutely demo a solution or a technical pattern or a project or something cool that you've created or found in the community. Uh, we would love to see that. In fact, we've made it super easy for you to be able to apply and request a demo spot to do that. You can do that at aka.ms forward slash m365pnp slash request slash demo. We'd love to see you contribute on GitHub. Uh, there's a variety of ways in which you can do that, places in which you can do that, and we'll show you as we move through uh, the slides today. And of course, we'd love to hear feedback. Uh, we want to hear what you'd like to see more of. Uh, maybe what's not working for you, we just ask that you keep it positive and constructive, but we're here to support you and the community to help you get the most out of the technology. Now, I mentioned a number of resources that are available to you. Let's take a quick look. There are a plethora of videos, developer and community videos. We've got a whole host of open source projects such as uh, CLI for Microsoft 365, PNPJS, a whole host of additional sample galleries for Teams, SPFX, Power Platform, List Formatting. There is no end to the uh, resources that are available to you. And you may say, wow, that is a lot of links. How do I keep track of that? No need. One link to watch, aka.ms forward slash m365 slash community will give you access to all of these resources and more. Now, this is one of the community calls that you are on today, but there are lots more. The Microsoft 365 platform call, which is a weekly call, currently on a summer break between July and the end of August, uh, is a Microsoft hosted call. And that means that all of the presenters are going to come directly from within Microsoft. That means that you're gonna get it straight from the mothership, which is a fantastic call. Make sure you add that to your calendar. There are a host of other community calls as well. Adaptive Cards, Microsoft Identity Platform, Office Add-ins, Power Platform, and then of course the two bi-weekly M365 community calls, which are the one you're on now, Microsoft 365 and Power Platform Development, and Viva Connections and SharePoint Framework. And those are bi-weekly, both on Thursdays, both at this exact same time. You can get the recurrent invites from aka.ms forward slash M365 slash calls. Now, you're going to see a number of areas uh, in which you can contribute and work within today, but you do not need to be intimidated by them. We have a program that is here to provide you support in the form of hands-on guidance. So you can learn how to do things like submit your first pull request, uh, help curate community docs. Perhaps you want to learn more about writing for the web, our newest session with Emily Mancini and Hugo Bernier getting rave reviews. You are welcome to join any one of these. They are hands-on safe space opportunities for you to get more involved in the community. And what that means is that we work together with you hand in hand, showing you how to accomplish a variety of these things. Uh, and it is a safe space because we don't record it, so you're free to ask any and all questions that you would like. It's a great way to collaborate with the community, so we invite you to sign up for the sessions. We're getting new August dates for our Power Platform Samples contributor. That just happened yesterday, so be on the lookout for those new dates. And there are already dates for writing for the web, so we invite you to sign up for those. Once you have contributed, we want to recognize and celebrate all the amazing work that you're doing in the community. Uh, the recognition program is here to do just that. It's a formal and official program in which we partnered with Credly to create digital badges. Yes, those same badges that you get when you're Microsoft certified, they're allowing you to 
associate them to your LinkedIn profile. You can share them on Twitter. You can put them on your blog. You can put them on the fridge. I know I have. Mom's proud, right? So we want you to be able to share them with everyone in a formal and official way. And we know that that's important when you're trying to show that you're making a difference in the community to your managers or your clients. So please don't hesitate. We do need you to opt in aka.ms forward slash M365 PNP dash recognition. You only need to do it once uh, and we will keep track of your contributions. If you have any questions or perhaps you're seeing others get badges and you think that you're eligible for a badge, don't hesitate to reach out to myself or Hugo Bernier. Uh, we're still working on all the automation. So sometimes things get a little lost between the cracks, but we want to make sure that everyone is recognized. Next up is PNP.NET libraries. And so we'll hand it over to Paolo. Yes, thank you, David. And uh, this week, we just want to remind you that the PMP framework and the PMP core SDK are almost on summer break. So we are still working on these libraries, but uh, we will see new releases right after the summer uh, break. Uh, we are working, for example, in the PMP framework uh, to introduce support for form customiz customizers uh, built with SharePoint framework, uh, as well as we are managing the pending pull requests and issues uh, as much as we can. And the same happens for the PMP core SDK. And please let us know if there is anything that you are really looking for. Uh, there is is a URL here you can see on the GitHub repo. You can submit your proposals for new uh, functionalities or new uh, tasks that you want us to take care of uh, in order to uh, improve the core library and the PMP framework library. And thank you. Back to you, David. Awesome. Thank you, Paolo. Uh, next up is MGT, otherwise known as Microsoft Graph Toolkit. Uh, this is a program or uh, toolkit that allows you to tie into the Microsoft Graph with super easy components. So uh, they are tools that are available to you. In fact, there is a new samples gallery, aka.ms forward slash MGT slash samples. Check that out. It's one of the newer features of uh, MGT. Uh, and it's super, super popular. And we're looking for more opportunities for people to get involved and assist there. So please don't hesitate. Next up is Independent Publisher Connectors with Natalie. Hi, everyone. Um, so right now we're at 51 awesome independent publishers, which is incredible, and 153 independent publisher connectors. So again, for those who might not be familiar with this program, this allows anyone to be able to submit a connector to the Power Platform. So these connectors show up in Power Automate, Power Apps, and also in Azure Logic Apps. So all these 153 connectors are live today if you want to use them, or of course, if you want to build them. Um, so on the slide here, I do in our GitHub, we do have a, a wiki called Top Connector Ask that we keep track of from uh, customers and forums if you're interested in building one of those. But of course, you're welcome to build whatever you'd like. And you're also welcome to add additional functionality to a connector maybe that you've used, but you wish that there was another action or trigger. Um, you're more than welcome to do that as well and collaborate with folks in the community. In terms of new connector submissions recently, so Troy has submitted numerous connectors within the past two weeks. Um, and we also got a new independent publisher, Harold. Um, Harold has built the SOS inventory connector. So we're really, um, we're really happy to have Harold uh, in the community as well. Thanks, everyone. Excellent. Thank you, Natalie. It's really great to see all that. Uh, Troy, you're rocking it out. So thank you for those contributions. Next up is Script Samples. This is one of the newer and most popular repositories and programs that we've got. 158 scenarios and 242 scripts using Graph CLI for M365, PowerShell, SPO Management Shell, and more. So this is a, a fantastic wide spectrum of opportunity to be able to not only consume information and data that's going to help you in your day-to-day -day work, but also how you can contribute because there's so many opportunities. So don't hesitate to check them out. We absolutely want to ensure that everyone uh, uh, is an, has an opportunity. And of course, we have a dedicated badge for that. So it's a very, very cool opportunity and program. You can see more at aka.ms forward slash script samples. And moving on to Microsoft Team Samples with Bob German. All right, so um, it's, it's time for a confession. I have to make a confession. I misspoke a couple of weeks ago and told everyone that Marcus Moeller's Really cool example with 
movie watching and voting for movies together that it was using the fluid framework because he and I had just discussed the fluid framework, but actually that first version, cool as it is, didn't have the fluid framework. So today I'm here to announce that take two, this time really with the fluid framework so that you can see the votes update in real time. If you're not familiar with fluid framework, this is the API that makes the loop components work and you can write your own. So you wanna learn how, check out Marcus's blog article and sample and thanks again to Marcus and to everyone in the community. Love to see more team samples. Um, there's contribution guidelines right there and back to you, David. Awesome. Thanks, Bob. That is really, really cool. I'm a big fan of the Fluid Framework, so uh, super cool to see that uh, instant collaboration. Thank you, Marcus. Oh, so we've got Power Platform samples. Uh, now, these are samples that are, again, of covering the spectrum of Power Platform. We've got two new samples. Uh, in fact, one is directly from a Sharing is Caring graduate just from yesterday. Matt, thank you so much, a keyword tagger app. We've also got Michael Mendez, who has provided a SharePoint site creation bot. This is the first uh, PVA sample that's been added. So thank you for setting that up, Michael. That's fantastic. And then updates for the accessibility color checker app from Louisa Free. So really appreciate all these samples and updates. You are all rocking. It. Uh, some of those are still pending PRs, and we will get them processed in just the next little bit. So thank you so, so much for the, from the, uh, for the community for all these amazing contributions. All right, what time is it? Picture time. Let's share our cameras. If you would like to show your fantastic faces on Twitter and the social networks, uh, and I will move this over. We'll select a scene. All right, go ahead and turn that camera on. And we will start recording here in just a minute. All right, as soon as we see that countdown, still room for some more. All right, still see some cameras turning on. Woo, we're still still filling in. There we go, got some more. All right, all right, let's give it a wave, everybody. Do the Seb, all right? We got a bobblehead back and forth. <laughs> all right, fantastic. Excellent, all right. Well, let's move into our rock star demo presenters of the day. Uh, we're going to kick it off with Ankit on document automation with syntax content assembly. So feel free to take over the screen share. Great. Thank you so much, David. Um, I'm just sharing my screen. Perfect. Looks great. Great. So before I jump into uh, content assembly, I just want to uh, recap a little bit about what SharePoint Syntax is. So at SharePoint Syntax, our goal is to help you organize your content into insights, into knowledge that you can use to transform your business processes. And how do we do that? We do that by really simplifying machine learning and advanced AI and helping you leverage human expertise that you already know to build low code, no code AI models and then deploy them to extract those insights really easily. Now, as part of SharePoint Syntax, we, we try to get into the entirety of content lifecycle. So we have content understanding where we help you build low-code, no-code models to extract insights from your forms, from your documents, uh, help you assign sensitivity labels. We also have functionality around metadata search, uh, uh, which helps you search for documents easily in SharePoint libraries. But now we have also added content assembly. What this content, content assembly? It is really about helping you generate content from all the insights that you have extracted. Now imagine there is an insurance claim that comes to a user. The, you can actually extract information like the claim ID, the claim amount, and then send it for review or approval. Once the review happens, you can use the same information that you have extracted to actually generate a, an insurance claim letter for your client informing them whether the claim is accepted or rejected, and all that can be done using syntax, the different components of syntax to understand, to discover, and then to generate these, uh, this content. Moving on to the demo. Okay, so for the demo, imagine that you are a recruiter uh, who's responsible for, uh, you know, creating all the consulting and service agreements for different vendors that you actually hire in your organization. Now, the way that you have uh, that you would do that today is to possibly create a, a you, you know you have a sample contract already. You would actually open it in Word, 
uh, you have the details coming to you in either emails or some other format, and you you will manually enter those details in the contract to generate the contract, uh, the agreement or the uh, consulting agreement or the service agreement, and then you will actually get it reviewed and send it out to the customers. Now this is both error prone in terms that you know there's manual intervention involved, and we actually want to simplify this process for you and make it easy for you to generate this repeatable content, the consulting and service agreements again and again. So what we have done is help you create templates from any existing document that you already have. So if you are a SharePoint Syntax licensed user, you can go to any document library. You will start seeing a new option called Create Modern Template. You hit on this option, and then we let you upload any file from any Word document from your existing, uh, from your OneDrive or from your device. So I'll just select this contract because you know it says sample contract. So let me select it and use it to build the template. So it takes a little bit time to load in this. Once it's loaded, you can start by identifying what is the dynamic content really in this contract that will change from one contract to other. Right? Not everything in the contract in terms of the, con uh, the conditions, the clauses may change, but there are certain things which will change from one contract to other. You can identify that and start creating placeholders for them. In this case, you can simply select the text that you want to create a placeholder for. Give it a name. And we allow you to associate it with three types of data sources. One is you want the user to add it, uh, enter it manually, and you can support these six data types for manual addition. You can also use a SharePoint library or a, li a list as a data source, and we also allow you to associate it with your with the already set up managed metadata in your organization. So for now, I'll just set it up uh, start by selecting it as a list. We show you all the lists that you have access to. Here, there's a list called contractor details, which the organization has set up in case you know all the new contractors that we want to work with, their details are present here. You say next, title contains the name. You can hit save. Once you are done, you can hit add to add this placeholder. Now you can create as many placeholders as you want for this document. There's no limit as such. Whatever dynamic text you feel needs replacement, you can do that. I'll just create one more because I want to demo another functionality and associate it with the same SharePoint list. Notice how we have pre-selected the list for you. It's highly likely that you will actually be working with the same list. You select the address, hit save and add. Now, once you're done, you can actually go ahead, rename this as, uh, you know, let me just rename it at service agreement template. Go ahead, publish the uh, template, create as many placeholders as you want. You can go ahead, publish the template. Once the template is published, it is now available in the new menu in the document library. So if you go, uh, go to the new menu, you will start seeing a new template here called the service agreement template, which any syntax license user can now come back and use to generate the document. To generate the document, you simply need to click this template. Notice how we show you all the information in terms of, hey, there are uh, two placeholders that you need to fill in. There are uh, the, here are the two placeholders that you have to fill in. I'll start by renaming it and saying, hey, you know what? I want to create a service agreement for somebody called Bob. You'll see that the list values are auto populated here. If you want anything here, you can add it, or you can also invoke the list directly from, uh, from this uh, button. So let me select Bob to Bob. Let's say OK. And notice how the address has been auto filled because we were able to identify a unique record in the SharePoint list, and hence we auto filled the placeholder. So this is a functionality which we provide out of the box without you having to go through the hustle of filling in all the uh, placeholders. Uh, once you have done, you have filled in all the placeholders and you are ready to publish, you are ready to create the document, simply hit create. And at the time of creating, we allow you to rename the document if you want, but we also allow you to create the document in two formats, either the Word or the PDF format. So I want to document in a PDF format. Let me create a PDF and say create. Once done, you'll see that the document is available. Uh, the PDF document is available in the library. 
and notice that we have changed the placeholder values uh, in the document. So this is how you can actually uh, convert any uh, any of your existing documents into a template that you want and use it again and again to generate repeatable content. Now, you know, this is not the end of it. We are actually working on a lot of lot more functionalities which are going to come really, really soon out. And some of those functionalities include you know, templatizing entire tables, templatizing images. We also want to ensure that the values that you fill in as feed in those placeholders, uh, you can directly tag them as metadata of the document so that you don't have to write any other model or you know, uh, uh, to extract those values again. And something that we are really excited about is also uh, uh, we are uh, we are actually uh, releasing uh, very soon a preview action in Power Automate in SharePoint Connect and Power Automate uh, to help automate the entire document generation process where you don't actually have you can directly generate a document when a list item is added, modified or deleted. Uh, you can tie it with a content assembly template and then generate the document automatically. So that's it. Thank you. Awesome, Ankit. Thank you so, so much. That's very, very cool stuff. Really appreciate you taking the time to share that with us today. All right. We're doing great on time, so plenty of time left for Ian and Chris. Ian, building an app for Microsoft Teams, which creates conversational tabs and conversations based on external events. Feel free to take on over the screen share. Good morning, folks. Afternoon, evening, wherever you are in the world. Uh, thank you very much for having me. My name's Owen. Yes, this is quite a mouthful of a title, so apologies for that. Yeah, so I wanted to showcase a scenario in Microsoft Teams development that we've been working on that while it's possible today, it's not something that's like immediately obvious from the documentation and samples that exist. But before I run into a new sample, let me quickly summarize some key building blocks that we're using. So conversational tabs is something that has existed in Teams for a while and allows you to create a conversation around a sub entity or tab inside of a Microsoft Teams um, application in your channel. So in the left hand side here, you'll see an image where you can have a conversation about the content in the, on the, in the tab essentially. Um, this is done using the Teams JavaScript SDK and it's, it's a simple way to add uh, collaboration to your app. It, but one kind of issue is it's kind of like a fire and forget where like the ISV or the app might create the conversation, but then it, the conversation happens without the ISV being aware of it or even like getting much to a say inside of it. But one of the key things it does allow you to do is that it allows you to pass in a conversation ID, and this is used to help um, reopen a conversation in the future if somebody comes back to the entity in the sub entity in the future and you want to talk about the conversation again. Oh, sorry, one thing I forgot to mention, this conversation actually takes place inside of the channel. And so any any in the po channel's post, you can see this conversation also. And so it allows for like a uh, communication to be specific to a sub entity, but available to the entire group. And this, sorry, and this conversation idea we're storing is useful in our POC that we'll see in a second. The other thing that I want to talk about is bots and teams. And if you're aware of any sort of teams apps, I'm sure you're aware of bots. And they're very useful for creating and responding to conversations. Uh, activity handlers, sending texts, cards, and images, emojis, etc. But again, it kind of focused on uh, responding to events rather than creating them, and that's perfectly fine. It's very useful for a lot of scenarios. But one thing we wanted to handle an app for the concept is actually creating conversations without having a bot being invoked directly. So bots and teams are built in the bot framework, and you can create conversations directly using the connected client. You are the server behind the, the bot as a associated with and bottom framework. And so our proof concept, we wanted to create a proof of concept that allows you to have a conversation about an event that happened externally. And then you can have context about that inside the tab. So an example of this that might be implemented is like an omni-channel support where you got a support channel and each um, support inquiry ends up in a a specific channel and teams. You can open up that inquiry, have a chat about the inquiry, and in the left hand side, you can have uh, more context provided. Or maybe you do this with job applications where each application, uh, each candidate's application can be visible as a conversation. And you can view the CV in the left hand side and talk about talk with your managers and um, recruiters in the chat in the right hand side. Or even like incident management um, where you have a new conversation for each incident and you can view details and graphs about the incident in the main tab. Not that I recommend using Teams as an incident manager. So from the building blocks that I was discussing earlier, 
um, you can get the service URL that we need to create a new conversation from the bot install activity. You can create a conversation using the bot client. You can send a conversation ID to a tab that is created from that conversation that you just created a bot client um, to be used in the conversational tabs. And then you can open a conversation in a side panel. So these all things are separate kind of ideas, I suppose, but you can build them together into a great example inside Microsoft Teams. So let me kind of quickly showcase this and hopefully this all works out. So this is a sample Teams channel I've got going. Um, you can see we've got a few different channels. We've got a general channel um, that includes information about uh, our sales tickets. We got a finance channel, just a final things, and we got an IT team that contains information about um, IT tickets. And so you can see here we got a few inquiries that I've created that I've created this morning just to showcase this sample. But before I jump into that, let me quickly kind of create a new um, ticket. And you can imagine this, this is kind of like a stand in for an external service. So in the real world, this might be a um, IT help desk or some other instance. But here we're kind of like just instead of creating a whole new service with us, this is our external service in inverted quotes. So let's say Mike is going to create a new question. He's going to say, I have lost my charger for my laptop. Can you help? And so this is coming from an external server somewhere and it's going to end up in our channel. And you see here now on the bottom side, we've created a brand new conversation using the bot framework to for Mike's inquiry. We can open this detail directly. This will bring us into our tab where you can see information about the, the inquiry. You can open up the conversation on the left hand side where you can see more information about it. Um, and I can reply and I tag someone and say, hey Adele, do you mind shipping like a charger? And this happens inside a team. So if I go back to the, the posts directly, you can see that my, comp, my, my message to Adele has showed up already. It's very useful. You can also go via the actual tab directly and in the tab itself, we've got a list of all the tickets that are currently available and you can open up a different ticket um, view information about it and reply to the conversation directly and this one hasn't been responded yet so let me get Lynn on this hang on this any updates but one of the very and so one thing about conversation tabs is that you can only create them inside of a channel so a conversation tab cannot be created in a group chat or a personal chat or one-on-one -on -one chat um but what you can do is um, have a personal app that references conversational tabs directly so in this scenario we've got a conversational tab where our support technician is able to see all of the uh, instance from every department that they are a member of. And we use this, to do this, we use Microsoft Graph. So we're querying Microsoft Graph to get the users teams and the channels they're a member of. And we then use that information to filter out the, the support departments that exist to show that user just like here are the tickets that are available to you. So this is very useful if you need to have a, a technician across multiple teams that's working with these things. And so somebody can open up, the technician can open up a specific inquiry, open up the conversation, have a chat um, and reply directly. And that conversation will end up back in the Teams channel where this post was originally posted. So you can see that ended up here. here. So that's very useful for me and um, kind of single place of working for, for the ITM. So we'll run through the code in a second, but just as a quick summary again of what just happened. Is a simple workflow of proof of concept. So on the left, you can see that a support request comes in for a customer that ends up hitting an external endpoint um, or the external endpoint controller, where we create a new conversation for the request, and that conversation ID is stored with the, along with the request in a database. Inside a Teams client, then you can view the conversation in a channel. You can open up the sub entity or the, or the specific request in a in the tab view by deep linking to it. And in the tab view, it queries the debate database for the request details and the conversation ID. So that can be opened up in the tab sidebar. 
This code is available today on the Microsoft Teams sample repository, but before that, I'm going to run through quickly um, the stuff that, the little pieces that kind of might be of most of interest to how this all works. To do this, I'm going to actually use a thing called CodeTour, which is it's available in, in the um, repository that is shared, and it's a very useful way of kind of jumping through the code simply. So when, when we first installed the bot, this is um, using the on-team members added async method, we store information like the service URL. This is used so that we know how to send a, send a create conversation request to the bot in the future. Um, we store this along with the team's team ID, um, and, as you, and so later on when we have to create a new conversation, we say, what's the team ID? Okay, here's the service URL for that, for that team. I'm going to skip a few things just to make sure I'm not going over on time. But essentially, we use we're storing everything at the moment in our sample using an in-memory database, but in a production environment, this would obviously be you need to have a more reliable um, data store. Um, I'm gonna skip that. All right. So when we creating a new support department or something similar, we Authorized to make sure the user who is trying to create this um, um, department is a member of the team that they are creating the department in. So we do a quick authorization. We do we call, make a sorry, excuse me, we make a quick call to Microsoft Graph to ensure that they, the user is a member of that team. Yeah, no, listen, sorry. So when a user creates a new inquiry, here we hit the external controller endpoint. Uh, in here, we pass, we, we kind of navigate down through the code, but essentially we we create a new uh, sub-entity. This new inquiry sub-entity uh, gets information about the support department here. That support department includes information like the service URL that we stored initially when the bot is first created. Or first installed, apologies, including the team's channel ID, the tenant ID. We get the, the bot ID from our settings, and then we've created an adaptive card that includes all the information, including the customer's inquiry details. This conversation and parameters are then sent, and we try and create the conversation directly. And when a conversation, if that conversation is created correctly, we update our state a database store with the customer inquiries and the conversation ID. Um, yeah, and so on code culture. So you have kind of jumped a bit too, jumped to go on a few on a few points here. All right. In the front end, in our tab directly, we make a call. So if you need to actually load an inquiry or a sub entity into a tab, we make a call to our back end where we query the support department, the, the inquiry based on its sub entity ID. As part of this query, we get a conversation ID returned, and that ends up calling this open conversation function. This is calling the Microsoft Teams SDK, and it's passing in the conversation ID that has been returned from the API. And this is how we actually can show the same conversation multiple times. And um, there's a few things along in, in this setup that is also important to have where you need to have callback handlers for when somebody closes the conversation tab directly using the X button. And that actually opens conversation tab. So you can have it all entirely in one big flow from start to finish where you can create an external conversation. I say create an external inquiry that led, leads to a conversation being created that leads to a the inquiry being visible the conversation created inside of a tab where you can reply and uh, you can have a lot of uh, communication inside of Microsoft Teams. Then. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, feel free to throw them in the chat. I'll take a look at them um, and thank you, David, for your time. Awesome, awesome stuff and and in and, and bonus points for the uh, code tour. A lot of fans here for that. Uh, there's some questions in the uh, chat. So just in the interest of time, I'll let you kind of cover those uh, there in the chat. But thank you for the fantastic demo today. No All right. That takes us to our last demo. What is that something I hear in the background? Is that what I hear? Oh, some galloping. Chris Kent. <laughs>
List formatting, Warrior Horses. Chris, take it away. Oh, yeah, dog. All right, everybody. I'm, uh, I'm Chris, and uh, we're going to talk about some uh, stuff. So let's do that. All right. Boom. All right, we're going to head over to our classic Warrior Horses site. All right. Well, we'll just ignore those. It's fun. Okay. We'll hide up with that face. So sorry, David. All right. So let's talk about what uh, the horses are up to. So the horses are always trying to... Uh, look into new things and work on stuff. And so we're going to take a look at R&D. They've got a new R&D site where they're doing their research and development. And here's where they're going to gather up uh, all the different ideas for how things are working. They're going to gather up, uh, you know, different initiatives and so they can kind of view what's happening. They can comment. They can work together on them. And that sounds like a great idea. And they hand it to someone who that's not their job. They have another job. But, you know, it seemed fine at first because they were very excited about it. All right. So, what they said was just email me your new research initiative. That sounds good. And then they create a little page for it, uh, then link it back, and then they can check it out. And that seems okay at first, right? But things have picked up. And now we're talking you know, two to three a week, and we're looking at more of these. And it's gotten a little crazy. We're trying to manage all that. And so now we're going to talk about what could we do to make that better, right? So that's a common scenario, right? Something starts small, gets a little bigger, but you still don't have funding or budget to do uh, anything much beyond the out of the box, right? So let's see. So in this case, right, uh, our lovely uh, manager of the R&D and M site, uh, what they're doing is when they receive an email, they're putting things in a list because, you know, they thought a few things through. So they've got a list here. Um, they put them in this list and that's cool. And they have the details, you know, the key details, they're having them email them, right? And they're hoping that maybe they'll make this a form that they can later have, you know, individuals fill out and so on. And once they, you know, put these items in here and they create a page, Right, they've got this template here, so they create a page, research initiative, and then they fill out some stuff. For instance, here is page, they've just linked, and so they've created a page for that research initiative. Right, oh, this is lovely. So excited about this. All right, so that's okay, right? But they've got to copy this information over, it doesn't look great, right? And they've got to do this kind of manually, and as things ramp up, right, there's a lot of chance that they can make mistakes, things aren't quite right, uh, things are certainly not standard as they work through this. Um, for instance, they decide to add a new category. They got to go back through all the other research initiatives to add it. You can see it's a bit of an issue, right? So traditionally, you might solve this, right? If you're coming from a development background, you might do this as uh, SPFX, right? For instance, you might create a single page. You put an SPFX web part on it, and maybe you've got a query string that points to you know a list item, and then you're displaying that list item however you want, and, and that works pretty well. Uh, there are some big limitations, drawbacks with that, right? For one. Uh, this person doesn't have any funding, right? So they're, they don't have time to spin up development, even if it's the easiest SPFX web part in the world, right? There's deployment, there's other things that've got to go through approvals. It's a big hassle just to get that going sometimes, right? It could be the right call. But what if uh, they also want to take advantage of individual pages? So they want page comments, right? They want to be able to let the authors, they want the key information, but they want to let them add any other web parts they want and so on. So a single page template for just using query strings isn't a great model for that either. Right, so what can we do? Well, in this case, we want to we want to look at how we can make this information look better. Now, one of the things you might do, and this is a fine thing, sometimes you've got a small amount of information, is to use page properties. Right, so if you've seen this web part, you can add additional columns uh, to your page uh, site pages library, and you can show them here. Right, I can show the title, um, and that's cool. And you can add a whole bunch of these, and that would be a standardized way to do it. And you could have the, the metadata and set on the list. You could have it on the page. And that's one way, but you don't really get a lot of control over that. And this is a formatting demo, so you know that's not the solution. All right, so let's get rid of that. So what if we wanted to go a little further, right? We want to make this a little better. So we've gone back to our initiative site, right? And the first thing we want to solve is navigation, right? So we've got this, we've got this. So we have this navigational view, which is cool. It just gives us buttons so that we can click on those links. So if we go back to the home page. Let's just integrate that briefly. All right, so we can come in here and whatever this things you can do here, we don't care about that anymore. And instead, we're going to add the list and we'll pick our initiatives list. And then we edit that. This is where you can see we have the list and we can pick our view. And so in this case, we're going to pick navigation. Um, and we're going to hide all these uh, extra junk we don't want right here. I'll move you guys over here. All right, and let's apply that. And so that's cool. So now we've got this little thing here. And uh, because I've got weird section issues, that's a it's a list one part issue. I'm just going to turn off the section background shading so it looks good. All right. So now we've got this navigation that's going to be dynamic. Whenever we create an item in that list, right, we can click this and it's going to go to whatever site we pointed at. So we're solving some things with formatting. All right. But let's go a little further. So if we go back to our list, uh, which was let's go to resources initiatives. Uh, we have this idea of like what, what if we want to display this a little better? And we have this idea of a stacked view. 
So this is just some of those details. Right now, they're all stacked on top of each other, which doesn't look great. Uh, but it's a little more of the, the way we want to display this, right? And it'd be great if we could display that on the page. So if we go to a page, say we're on our horse claws page, right? We're just going to remove this whole thing or where's that button? I don't know. Let's just add a new one. There we go. We add our list here. And then we go to initiatives. And we're going to grab our view, right? And we're going to save that stacked view just as before. And then we're going to, you know, we'll hide these things just to make it prettier and wow, wow, wow. And get out of here and we apply. Well, that's not great, right? We still have multiple items here. Um, and in their infinite wisdom, the dynamic filtering is only for lists or libraries instead of being able to pull from query strings and some other stuff we might be able to do. Uh, so how do we do that, right? We could create an individual view for every item. And then we would be very, very sad that we were having to do that and maintain that. And that would just, it's not, it's not a good plan. Don't do that, okay? But what about this thing? What is this folder thing? Well, let's check that out. This is where we're really looking at it. This is the folder pattern. And so if we come back here, uh, the idea here is if we go back, let's just go to our all items view, it's a little easier. Um, if we go to our list settings, we're going to take advantage of folders. You're familiar with folders in document libraries where they're on by default, but you can do them in list as well. So if we go to our advanced settings and we just come down here and we say make new folder command available, we're going to say yes. And we're going to hit OK. And now we go back and the idea here is, well, not on navigation, let's go back to our all items. We could create folders, right? So let's create a folder. And we're going to call this one initiative for one. And there's a reason for that name. I'll show you. So I'm going to just create that. And then as I created a folder, and I can literally just grab this guy and stick it in the folder, right? So now I've got this in a folder. There's horse claws, and we could go back and we've got another folder and so on. But on our page here, now we can actually type a folder, right? Initiative two, three, four. Was that what it was? One, maybe? Let's try that. Get out of here. Supply. There we go. Look at that. So now we can actually use a folder to create a dynamic filter for us. All right. So now we're pulling back exactly the item we want here. All right. And we can we can go a little crazy. We can get rid of this name. Right. We can just say you know details or something. Right. And that looks pretty good. Right. Now we're pulling this in. All right. So this works pretty well. Right. So now we're just pulling from a single folder, um, and that's great. And we're we're getting a little further. Right. But. That's still a hassle, right? The idea that I've got to create a folder, I've got a signal there, I've still got to create the page, and then I've got to create a, the web part, and I've got to point it to the folder. I mean, again, I've got a little more dynamic here, but why don't we take this a little further, right? So why don't we make a way to have this folder stuff be automatic? So let's look at that. So we're going to go to integrate, we're going to go to power automate, and we're going to create a flow. And I'm just going to hit show more so I can get the, the template I want, which I just want when a new item is added. All right, this is the idea that whenever a new item is added to this list, I want to run my flow. All right, so we'll continue here. And we get a nice little starter. It's pointed at our list. Wow, wow, wow. And that's exciting. Now, the first thing we, we need to check, though, is we've got to check our trigger condition. So right now, we, we can create folders and everything else, but we don't want to run this when you create a folder because then we've created a folder for a folder. The whole idea is we're going to run this flow to create a folder for the list item and move the list item into that folder. So. In order to do that, we go up here and we go to settings and we've got this lovely trigger conditions here. And I'm just going to add one here and I'm just going to copy and paste. And all we're going to do is add equals. And we're just saying if it's a folder, don't run it, right? So pretty straightforward. So we're only running this flow when it's not a folder. So it's just a standard list item. So hit OK. So now what we want to do is we first we want to create um, a variable, right? So we're going to say edit variable there it is. And we're going to call this guy folder name. All right. And we're just going to generate. We just want standardized folder names. It makes things a lot easier to work with. So we're going to make this a string. And we're going to use a little formula here. I'm going to do an expression. And in this case, I want to concat. All right. You guys got to watch me type an expression here. This is going to work out. So to dash. Right. And then we want to put, just like we did before, we want to format that ID. Right. So we're going to say format number. Here. And the way the format number works is we're going to take an item and then we're going to say pad it basically with zeros. So we're going to put five zeros in there. We're going to pad it. Now we need our dynamic item here. So we'll go to dynamic content and we're just going to scroll down till we find ID. Boom. There we go. Now we've got a little formula that's going to build. And if we can see it a little better, basically we're going to format. We're going to say initiative dash and then, you know, up to five zeros with our ID in there. And that just kind of gives us a standardized folder name which is exciting. I do recommend changing these titles, but I'm not going to 
in terms of speed here, but let's keep going. So now we want to uh, create a folder, right? So let's do that. So we're going to do that uh, using this. So we're going to say folder, and we got uh, create new folder. Then we pick our site right there. And then we're going to pick our list, of course, which is that same list. Oh, you can do it. There we go, initiatives. And then our folder path, well, that's our folder name. There we go. So we're creating a nice folder there. And then we want to move our item to the folder. Now, that's a little less straightforward, of course. And in that case, we're going to use a SharePoint HTTP call. SharePoint HTTP. And there it is. Now, this is an HTTP call, but it is not a premium connector because it goes to SharePoint. So, yay. All right. And we're going to click this. So we're going to go R, D, and M. And we're going to say this method is actually a post. And then let's copy some stuff because I don't want to type all that out here. So let's grab this. And let's paste that sucker in there. Ooh, I'm going to zoom this at all. There we go. That might be a little easier. OK. And so the idea is here, I'm going to get by server relative URL. I've got it to my list, initiatives. Instead of item ID, right, I actually need to replace that with dynamic. So let's do that, blah, 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 blah. And then our dynamic content, we don't want, we want ID, but we don't want the one from the create new folder. We want it from when the new item is created, that ID. And then we want to move it to our folder name here. So let's back over to that, insert our dynamic content, which was just the folder name. And then once again, we need the item ID, All right? There we go, and let's grab that ID. Boom, so now we go. Now we're gonna be moving the item into the folder. So now we've created the folder, and we're gonna move the item into the folder, and that is very, very exciting. Okay, so let's see if that works. We're just gonna do a quick test on that one. After we save, of course, now we'll test. All right, we're gonna save manually, so we don't have to wait the, you know, up to five minutes. There we go. And now we just go over to our list. And let's just create a new item, All right? We'll just call it uh, super research. I don't know. Wow, 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 wow. Perfect. All right. Now we'll give it a category just for funsies, All right? And uh, duration is six weeks. And we'll pick a start date. None of these are required, but I just feel like filling out and it's a good time. All right. And we'll save that. All right. So now we've got a new entry here. And if we check our flow, we cross our fingers, we hope. Boston prayers and all that. And there we go. It has run. And so now if we go back, we should see. Maybe I'll just refresh to be certain. Ah, we have initiative four. And if we click that up, we have our super research was automatically moved in there. And that's very cool. Uh, and so then what we can do here is we can actually turn off. Like if we don't like this folder view, all right, if you haven't seen this before, you can go to edit current view. Um, you come down here to folders. And even though they are folders and everything's in folders, you can show them without folders. So it will flatten everything so it looks just like a standard list and nobody even needs to know you've got those ugly folder names back there. But now you've created those as flow. So now you've got a way to point to each individual item on a page. So let's go a little bit further because, hey, I still got a couple minutes. So that's exciting. So if we go back to our flow, right, let's go further, right? So we have this idea that we want it on a page. We know that. So let's do that. Let's put it on a page. So in order to do that, we need to take our template first. Let's go to our template and let's edit this template. So we're gonna edit our page template and let's set it up as an actual template we wanna use. We'll just get rid of whatever that was, right? So we're saying a basic page is gonna have a list. It's gonna be the initiatives list. And we know we want it to point to, you know, initiatives and we wanna to go to the stacked view and we want the folder. We're just gonna put in here initiative, what was that, 004, right? There we go, let's apply that, see if that worked, okay. Yep, and then we get rid of these guys, just so we have, there we go. So here is our exciting template, right? And what we wanna do here um, is, we're just gonna leave this as is for a minute. Well, actually, let's go to the page template before I forget. Okay, so we saved our page templates. Now we've got a template, and we know that it's at our research.aspx in our templates folder. So if we go back to our flow, um, and all I did, by the way, in case you weren't familiar, is I just created a page and there's an option instead of save as draft to save as template. That's the only thing I did there. It's not strictly required, but I find it is easier to do that. So let's go add a new step. And in this case, now we need to create a copy of that template. So this is going to be another one of those posts. So HTTP. And we go HTTP request to SharePoint. And of course, we're going to pick our site. Ooh, where are you? Ooh, there you are. That's exciting. And this is another post because we're doing something here. 
And let's go ahead and again grab our URL we're going to replace. So I don't fat finger it. Boom. Okay. So what we're doing is we're getting the file by server relative URL, templates, research, ASPX, because that is the name of our page, right? And then we're going to copy it to our site pages. And in this case, we're going to use that folder name once again here, right? So we're going to say boom, folder name. So there we go. So now we've just uh, gone through and we've created a copy. So I'm going to rename that just for I'm lose my mind. Create copy of template. Okay, there we go. So that's cool. Now I've created the copy of the template. And in order to work with that, now we need to get details about that, right? So now we actually have to get metadata about that. So let's see, get file metadata. And in this case, we're going to pick the uh, what is it? The R and D side. Perfect. Okay, and our file identity or file path. Which one did I pick? Not file metadata. Is that right? No, I don't know. <laughs> this one's different. Let's see. Did I have the right step here? Let me add one more step here. We're going to try that one more time. Because this part's fun. Okay, let's make sure I picked the right metadata one. I think I did, but I'm going to double check before we try and run this thing. All right, so we want to get the uh, file metadata using path. That's the one we want. Perfect. Okay, so get rid of that. Get out of here, you guy. You don't need you. Boom. All right. Okay, so that's why I look different. All right, so now we need to pick our site correctly. So in this case, what we're doing is we're going to the page we just created, and we're just doing this so we can get the nice ID from it, right? So we're going to say our file path in this case. We're just going to type it as site pages, right, slash, and then our dynamic content is the folder name. All right, and we're going to type dot ASPX. There we go. There we're going to get our page metadata, and then we've got to check it out since we're going to edit the page, right? So now we're going to do another HTTP action. I love those They're good times. All right, and so in this case, we're going to pick our site one more time, and our method is going to be post again. And once again, let's copy this guy from over here. Our API endpoint, boom, is just our page item ID right here. We're going to backspace over that so we can insert it. And it's going to go dynamic content, and we got file metadata using path. We got that item ID, boom. We're going to check out that page. That's all there is to checking it out. And now we're going to update the page. Now, this one's a little crazy. So let's see what we can do here. Now, this is an HTTP post once again. And we'll get it set up, and then I'll show you what we're going to do here. So once again, pick our site. Ooh, pick the site. There it is. And our method is once again post, because we're doing stuff. And the URL is this save page as draft endpoint right here. And let's once again, before we forget, let's take up the dynamic piece, insert that item ID. OK, so now we want to save page as draft. But in order to do that, we need the actual content of that page, right? So good news, I got a trick for you. We're going to hit F12 in our browser or bring up our dev tools, whatever you've got that configured for, right? And we're going to switch to the network tab. I'm in Edge, but this works in Chrome and Firefox and all these other things. I'm going to just go to network. I'm going to record the traffic. I'm just only interested in these fetch requests for now. Um, let's edit the page, right? Just so I can hit save page as template. Let's see. Wait, let's edit the page one more time and try. Oh, did I actually turn it off? <laughs> yeah, you actually do need to record it. Okay, so save page template. You see, we have this save pages draft call right here. This payload right here. You know, we didn't really change it. We just said view source so we can read it this way. Sometimes you'll have to come here and expand it if it's really big, depending on how much stuff you put on your page. Literally copy this. I'm just going to copy that. Head back to your flow. And in the body, that's your body. So paste that. All right. And now what we're going to do is we're just going to go through and find a couple things, right? So we have this idea of our title was research initiative, right? That's what we set it up. How about instead of that, we backspace and we say, where's our dynamic content? Dynamic content, in this case, we want the title, right? So let's get the title from when a new item is. Named. So we're going to name our page right there as title. And then what we want to come down to is we want to find here is Initiative 004, make sure that's the right one. The folder, folder path, here's the folder path right here. So we want to change our folder path so we can dynamically insert that as well. And we'll get rid of that guy. Insert our folder name. And then I think there's one other spot we have to put it as well. And that would be selected folder key, which is right here. Yeah, here with that. Okay. Let me make sure I'm doing the right one. Yep, select a folder key, press it to F, boom. 
backspace over that guy. And then once again, we're going to folder name. OK, so now what we're really doing here is we're taking the whole page contents, right? And we're taking the properties that we configured and we're just dynamically swapping in a couple of things that we just did. And then we're going to save that page as draft. All right. And then the last thing we need to do is we need to publish that page that we just did. So one more HTTP action and we should be done. Let's see. Let's see. We have one more SharePoint number four. Awesome. Now let's grab our site one more time. The end it is again a post. And our URI is publish in this case, so very similar. I'll take our page item ID back out. More time and then we're going to grab item ID. OK, now assuming I typed all that, let's see what happens, shall we? Oh, all right, sorry, one last step. And that last step is to update the actual item, right? So we need to update the item. So update item. And in this case, we want to grab that site. One more time. Remember when I said one more time earlier and I lied to you? That was nice of me. All right, so we go to our initiatives and our ID is that original ID from way back up top. I'm so glad your fingers are crossed. Thank you. All right, there we go. And we'll just take the title because all required fields for some reason have to be mapped in. And uh, we love that so much. All right, we need a title. And in this case, we just want to update that page URL, right? Because we just created that dynamically. So we know that the page is in site pages actually we're going to put it on our site right site slash rdm slash uh, what was it site pages slash folder name dot aspx right so that's what we're doing now we could take this further we could add permissions you know individual permissions to the, the pages and all that stuff and then send emails like your page is ready and we can do all that kind of stuff if we wanted we could bring that form stuff in through uh microsoft forms in fact we've got a, a less than five minute demo on the on the youtube channel that'll show you how to take uh, Microsoft Forms and put those in the SharePoint list. So you could have all this kind of wrapped up together. So let's save and again, cross those fingers. OK, so now we're going to test it. Once again, manually test it. All right, and now let's see. Come on now. We're going to create a new item. And we're going to call this. Uh, hope <laughs> the research is hope. Did it work? There we go. We'll give us some categories just for fun. Oats and style and methodology. Great. And duration we're going to say is 78 years. And the start date is, uh, we'll say, uh, tomorrow. What is that? Or today. It's today. We're great. And we don't need to know that. And our budget is going to be uh, 78 million. Yeah, it's a lot. Hope costs quite a bit. OK, so now we're going to run that. And let's uh, let's see what, what happens with our flow here. Are we going to fail? Are we going to do it? Let's see. So we've gone through. We've, aha, flow ran successfully. Well, that's exciting. Let's see. So if we come back here, now we have hope. We can see that we've got a link right here to the page. All right, we click that. It actually takes us to a page research initiative. Oh, we forgot to update the title, but we can do that as well. But the idea is we just created a page. We dynamically, you know, set it up. We've got our navigation set up off of view formatting. We've got an individual format here. We don't have to have a view for each individual item. People then can control this page. They can add whatever web parts they want. You still have standardized display. And because you've got all the power formatting, you can make this look however you want. You can go really elaborate depending on the number of columns you have. You can integrate those power apps. We've done that as well. It's a pretty cool pattern. Um, and you can see if we go back home, we already have our new initiatives here in our navigation and things to sort of show up. And we could order this maybe by recent initiatives and just limit that to five or ten and so on. So now the person that was struggling to do, you know, two or three of these a week is just set all this up and it's automated um, and they're good to go and then get back to their regular job. Yay. All right. And just to wrap up here. Here's a couple of resources for you. So please check out our full documentation. We've got lots and lots of samples on on this and more. Uh, we've got samples on how to use the flow and, and other pieces as well, but there's also some tools available too. Uh, and that's about it for me. Thanks. Awesome, Chris. Yep, everybody's <laughs> excited, right? Even the horses. So very, very cool. Thank you everyone for uh, attending today. Let's wrap up here. Let me share the screen and we will wrap this puppy up today. Okay. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you again for our three fantastic superstars of the day, Anka, Eon, and Chris, for presenting those amazing demos today. The recording will be available in 24 hours on the Microsoft 365 
community YouTube channel. If you try to download it through the chat, you will not be able to. So make sure you subscribe, aka.ms forward slash m365 slash videos. Follow us on Twitter at Microsoft365Dev and or at M365PNP. Our next general dev call will be two weeks from today, August 4th at 7 a.m. And our next Viva Connections and SharePoint Framework call will be next week, July 28th. You can see all the calls at aka.ms forward slash M365 slash calls. Thank you, everyone, for attending the fantastic conversation and support in the chat. Have a wonderful rest of your week and a fantastic weekend. Thank you.